Hi there. Welcome to Mushroom Hour. Today on Mushroom Hour, we're grateful for the opportunity to speak with Amber Joy, co-founder of Moon Mountain. Moon Mountain is a biodynamic farm, wild food refuge, and all-around sacred space located in the beautiful Michigan wilderness among some of the oldest mountains in the world. This compound functions as a demonstration site for regenerative agricultural practices and serves as a hands-on medicinal plant classroom for their rural community. Now, as we become more conscious of our vital connection with the land, foragers eventually must reconcile the history of European occupation of quote unquote America and indigenous lands. Embracing their role of stewardship, Amber and her partner Ryan acknowledge that Moon Mountain sits in the homelands of the Anishinaabe, the Dakota, and the Menomine. Central to their work is their vow to remember these tribes' rich ancestral history and share the story of their genocidal removal from what is known today as the United States. I am really impressed by their willingness to face the shadow of our relationship with the land that we call America. It is also inspiring to see their ethos that's rooted in a conscious appreciation for all the privileges and gifts of their abundant environment and how that translates into a responsibility to share that abundance with their community as others have done before. Amber, thank you so much for joining us on Mushroom Hour. Thanks so much for listening and participating in this opportunity to exchange. Wow, I really like the way you put that. And I think I may use that for moving forward, <laughs> an opportunity to exchange, because that's what I hope to do today is exchange some really deep ideas and insights about, like I said, the shadow side of our, and when I say our, foragers, mushroom hunters, people connected to the land, our relationship with this land and what we should be considering and how we can be allies and authentic and our relationship to indigenous history. So a lot of big topics. But to kick us off, I would like to know a little bit about how you got into nature, how you got into mushrooms, maybe how you and Ryan met, how Moon Mountain started, a little bit about how you got to where you are today. All right. Well, a sweet place to start, I suppose, is uh, at the beginning. You know, I've always been one of those folks who get sucked into the patterns of nature, filling my pockets with shells and feathers and stones and finding them as little tokens and making maybe small altars, though that's not what I would have told you in my childhood. I, I think many of us are very curious about the things that are, are in our environment. And I grew up in the suburbs. And I think one of the privileges of the suburbs is you have small green spaces um, that you don't necessarily see in inner city environments. So I was very fortunate to be exposed to tall trees and shrubs and flowers and mushrooms and all kinds of things just in my own sort of walking block or biking block of, of where I was growing up. Right. So uh, I didn't always live off the grid out in the mountains, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and I think that's a good thing to just point out is that um, for myself, it was an incremental transition. Yeah. And I think often things are incremental and I'm not sure that we give ourselves enough credit acknowledgement of all the small steps that it takes to achieve something much larger. And so one thing that I like to dispel is the belief that myself or Ryan, uh, that either of us knew what we were going to always do and we saw a clear path to get here. It's been through a series of both very, very fortunate and blessed and wonderful situations and life paths, but it's also been being rejected in other areas and opportunities or having things not come to fruition in the sense that we perhaps hoped. And mm. so it's been both our major joys in life and some of our major darker days that have created a meandering path to where we are now. Loving what we do so much now, we are very passionate and we share it very openly and I do believe that sometimes it can create a perception that 
we've always known. And so that's right. something I'd like to just put out there that every person's individual journey is unique. And I do often get asked the question, what would you do to transition to a more alternative lifestyle? And that's like, well, would you like to get a cup of tea or coffee? Because this might be a while. There's a lot of little steps. <laughs> I don't see the the easy button when I don't see our ability to jump from the red corner to the blue corner. I think it's a lot of little things. So for myself, I had that curiosity. I was drawn in by nature. I meandered away from that. I definitely went down a path where the things that I was participating in were certainly not, how do you say, reflective of my, my inner soulful self. You know, you know, the big carrot of capitalism was definitely dangling and I saw the illusion of money being a key to freedom. Mm -hmm. And so that was one of my side steps, if you will, which I think is very common. <laughs> yeah, I could say a lot of things about capitalism and I think I'd just rather not. You hit on really the fundamental tenet, which is that money becomes the driving force and purpose in your life. And I think more and more as people get outdoors and reconnect with the non-human or the, the forces of nature that are extant of human culture, you start realizing what's really important and it really puts it in perspective. And so I think that is a fundamental shift that happens for a lot of people. And that's why I, you know, a little bit of my work is just encouraging people to get outside because for me, in my own transition, what you're describing from kind of suburban, let's even say corporate America into a, a more sustainable or alternative lifestyle, you eventually have to reckon with that idea of money as the sole purpose of your existence and the key to your freedom, like you said. So, you know, while all the paths may be different for people, I think that is one fundamental tenet people do have to reckon with as they decide to move away from the programming, the system, the matrix, whatever you want to call it, that we're all born into. And what I'm hearing a little bit from your story is that there was some mystery on going on this alternative path you chose. And it's like being open and flexible to, to where that leads. Absolutely approaching the unknown with a sense of curiosity is something that can't be undervalued. Yeah. We see a lot reflected in our culture that those who strive to greatness are bold and fearless and courageous. And I think uh, those are beautiful descriptions, but often we also have to consider all the personality traits or other intentions and energies that we have that help support our courageous self, that help support our unafraid self. And mm -hmm. often that's the lesser qualities, well, the qualities deemed lesser by our larger peer groups, which, you know, rarely do you hear someone say, well, gee, they're so patient. They are so <laughs> tender. They're phenomenal listeners. Those more feminine um, qualities perhaps are often viewed as softer, but really fundamental to some of those more frontline lenses of, of approaching life and realizing oh, now that I have a certain base level of need met, perhaps I can reprioritize some of these needs in my life. And it's an interesting thing to come to a place and say, actually, this money isn't fulfilling my deepest humanness. The humanity of me is not satisfied. And that doesn't make sense because I was always... I was always a believer of the story. If I can feed myself, clothe myself, roof myself, and then have a place from which to do that for others, that alone was supposed to be the pinnacle of the point of my existence. Right. And when you do get the privilege and opportunity to check all those needs boxes and you're serving others, strictly from a, a place of financial giving, but you're not actually engaged in the things that your mind and heart and self want to be involved in, 
that's when that alienation occurs. That's when that gap begins to open, I believe. And we have this reflection. And this was very true for me. And I can also say very true for Ryan. This is a big uh, thing that helps hold our relationship together is the belief in the, the danger of the alienation for whatever life circumstances or situations or moments of time we find ourselves in when we don't have a sense that our energy, actions, time, whatever our resources that we have access to are, whatever our privileges that we have access to are, when those aren't being used towards a goal that is embedded in our understanding of our life's purpose, Mm. we begin that gap in self between who we are and who we want to be. Right. And I think that for us, when we had those moments However things align, whether you say it's fate or dharma or uh, destiny or choose your sort of ethos there, we, we continue to choose respect and love and admiration and inclusivity and tenderness. And that often led us to what seemed at first as perhaps regressive choices, I can tell you for sure, as a young woman who was the first person in my family to be able to pay through my way through college and graduate with a college degree. It was, it was then very regressively received that I then decided to move to a small organic family farm in the South and spend four years understanding how to form a relationship with the food that I eat. Wow. Um, yeah. Right. So, so to go from a top 10 business school to in some people's perspectives playing in the dirt you know that that choice to move from a place of self-respect and love and care for others and a desire to have a lasting impactful life that that's one moment that's a really clear example of well that really looked regressive to a lot of my support system right so and, and you know ryan also had his own versions of that and the short of it is that for us those moments of alienation we were separately before we met on paths of questioning yeah. However, I want to really make a strong point to say, knowing what you're walking away from compared to what you're walking towards is two different propellers for a long time because we knew we were leaving our suburban middle American upbringing. We were trying on many hats that had different flavors, let's say, we, d- different feels, different tones. Right. It wasn't that clear for either of us at that time, oh, I'm going to actually move towards this set of parameters and desires and boundaries. It, incidentally, both Ryan and I ended up communal living in intentional centers where we were producing goods and and foods and services for our communities and that was deeply enriching for both of us and we happened to meet over a conversation around food sovereignty and food justice issues which we were was a very quiet conversation in our communities that opened the door to the both of us taking a phenomenal tour a food tour of the south and getting to know a lot more farmers and it's, you know, it's really interesting because Ryan was distributors for a small sort of kitschy grocer, but they were making direct connections with the farmers. So this was great mm-hmm. because we're taking a farmer's product directly to the consumer with a small fee in the middle. But I had been at this point farming for many years and I began to through that lens, loathe the idea of another person coming up in a truck, taking the food off and making as much money in that delivery as we were on six months of planning, hard work, sweat, preparation, etc. So I was definitely still strongly ego forward <laughs> at that time. And capitalism was still very much a strong part of what I was still trying to have make sense for me in a traditional way. It's very easy with my accounting and finance background to want to know how many tomatoes I have to sell to justify the gallon of gas it takes to drive the car there. I I think in those terms. And Ryan couldn't be more opposite. It doesn't occur to him to commodify and economically value any sort of thing. And I'm so 
genuinely grateful for that authentic part of his personality because it really balances the severity of my um oh it's honestly overall an economic sense of insecurity right something i i still am uprooting in myself this mm-hmm. sort of worry about money and easy enough right for a, a straight white cis able-bodied white man to say like oh don't worry about money right you know a lot of people are like come on give me a break but it is truly something that we have to learn to embody mm-hmm. it, it's not just someone can say to you hey man don't worry about where your next dime is going to come from just go live out in the woods and it'll all make sense there's a part of us that's like mayday this is yeah. an irresponsible choice. This doesn't make a lot of sense. And I'm going to have to get a bailout from somebody or I don't have a safety net. And this could be the end of all of the things I've worked so hard up until this point for. And it's a valid feeling if all of your life experience has led you to operate within that system where money is that important. Money is the key to security. So, yeah, it is important for people to realize that that's a valid reaction. But eventually you want to reckon with you know, what truly feeds you as a human. And again, that's easy from my perspective. All those things you labeled about white, able-bodied, cis, I I am all those things. So it's easy to say from my perspective, but you do have to reckon with that core of what gives your humanity. And in establishing a purpose outside of, you know, an economic system, which is kind of infectious, like you said, you see everything from a monetary value, you commodify everything. So is that truly what it is to be the most human we can be and the most fulfilled we can feel from that angle? And I think a lot of people realize it isn't and you want more engagement and connection and spiritual connection and money doesn't necessarily equate to those things. So while you need money to survive in the structure we've created, it's important maybe to override those alarm bells a little bit say, no, I'm making a move in the right, more fulfilling direction and recognize there might be a little, uh, a little heartache to get there, a little material heartache to get there. And if you're okay with that, or if you can reconcile that, that's you know a good starting point to start moving that direction. I think. I think that's really well said, and I like that you made it a point to say that if you can reconcile that, because these are such individual journeys that what perhaps I have the capacity to reconcile might not look the same as someone else's. Right, right. Or if people are, you know, in situations where they can't go out in the woods or provide for themselves or where they are reliant on a care system or a system that relies solely on money or, you know, some kind of disability payments. I know people that completely rely on disability payments. So it's hard for them to see that model. Uh, And that's where it falls to people who are able to reconcile it. People that are able to make those steps to end up being the way showers and starting a new path that others can eventually follow. And it's a long process to creating new ways of being and new ways of living on the planet outside of the completely economic centric system that we've created. And that is absolutely a core tenet of what we're trying to do here at Moon Mountain. Mm. We were fortunate in our time together before we were managing and operating Moon Mountain. We stayed at a pretty phenomenal place known as Freedom House Farm in Newport Ritchie, Florida by the esteemed gardener extraordinaire Jim Kovaleski. He's a phenomenal human, and he had a really profound impact on us. Part of his ethos at that small urban permaculture operation was the concept of a work trade. So we were able to stay at his place so long as we kept up on a certain list of his request of to-dos to be done during our duration there. And we had access to the gardens from which to play and explore and feed the community. That experience was so meaningful and it was so clearly a step for us away from our centers of alienation, specifically in the context we're discussing now, the egocentric focus on the monetary stability of any life choice. So to go from a place where we were going to have to worry about rent and insurance and utilities to transition to a place where... So long as we got a certain list of activities completed, 
then there was no threat of home insecurity. And so that was a very clear stepping stone. Yeah. And so now we offer that here in varying forms. We have an apprentice who is with us and gets a variety of tasks to do. And they're largely catered towards what that person's next steps are, what they're desiring to do next. So uh, let's say we get a young individual who's hoping to homestead after this. We'll make an effort and an energy to ask them to participate in things that are going to lead to a clearer understanding of what sort of systems they might want to design at their homestead. I wouldn't turn around and do that for somebody whose desire after this is to start an urban garden. We would take a totally different route and we'd make sure we talk about micro scales of things because keep in mind here on Moon Mountain, we're talking about 40 acres. Yeah. So you can very quickly get wrapped up into specialty forest products, orchard management. And then if you're talking about a 15 by 10 foot lot in an inner city, oh, let's go a totally different high production route here and talk about your environmental factors. Yeah. So it's it's wonderful because we get to not only give them a place to enjoy a stepping stone, but we also do a bit of mentoring because Ryan and I both have had such a variety of experiences this is our first time being rural folk and we're six years in and it's very intriguing. It's new for us and there are different factors. And so we're very much feeling both, oh, we've arrived at a place that feels like we're meant to be here and simultaneously we're the new, we're the new folks on the block and we're greenhorns. And so there's this wonderful sense of newness as well as, you know, there's days where I'm like, wow, I'm in my mid thirties. I thought I was going to have been here like 10 years ago. You know, I thought in my twenties, I was going to have nailed my place in space. <laughs> and, uh, it takes time, you know? So yeah. there's a lot of duality here, you know, um, between Ryan and myself's personality. And then most of the folks who stay with us for the apprenticeship are younger. So we get yeah. a lot of balancing of those energies. And we also take woofers, which is really, always interesting. I like getting the pulse of the nation from travelers with open minds. They're a really nice group to, to, to kind of rotate through. And then we also get the opportunity to explore things that maybe we haven't touched in a long time. So for instance, we have a woofer now who's a phenomenal young man and he's vegan. Yeah. And because of our plethora of fantastic local farms here, we do participate in beef shares and we have access to some really nice quality products. But what a wonderful thing for three weeks to practice a, dis a different discipline of eating and switch up what we're doing in our kitchen and exploring culinarily. And it's an opportunity to connect with an individual while supporting their needs to have autonomy in their food choices. Yeah. It is a bit communal living, but there's a lot of privacy and independence and safe space because that's really important for us that this is not only a place of work and recreation but also retreat and restoration and i think you're doing exactly what we talked about as people who have started that long transition from suburbanites to more rural folk and getting into these alternative lifestyles you're now creating a space where others can do that because when we sit around in tea houses and different collectives you know i live in marin county california there are a lot of people that want an alternative lifestyle and they want to try different ways of being that isn't so driven by the capitalist what i call kind of the machine system that's just how much can you produce and it kind of chews up and spits out your humanity and it's like well what are the steps to get there and there's a fundamental thing you come to, which is where are we going to have the space? Everything requires mm -hmm. money. There's property taxes. There's all these things about the dominant system that kind of force you to interact with it. So it's really important to have people like yourselves who are creating a space where people can learn and practice and develop their skill sets to then go maybe establish their own space somewhere else and start creating this decentralized network of alternative, alternative paths and way stations, if you will. Absolutely. I think you're talking about two different sorts of concepts there as well, which is wealth distribution. So for mm -hmm. us, that looks like we have 40 acres. That is a very specific type of wealth. Right. And let's share that. Yeah. And so it's not enough for us just to take the time to sit and educate with folks and to share space. But now we're realizing we need to find equitable plans to offering 
lending services so that folks aren't just able to stay as guests, but they have an opportunity to transition into their own local independent models of living. So we're not looking to always have this link of interconnection as a necessity. So if you are doing a work trade, let's say that work trade goes on for five or 10 years, which can happen. Yeah. Right. At what point are you violating the fundamental right to that person's ability to manage and own as well? It's not an easy transition to make. This That's a huge that concept. Works. That's a huge concept for a lot of people is, you know, getting in that mm -hmm. waters of making sure that people have access to land and ownership and that onus does fall upon the land owner to decide how they're going to start that progression off of getting people more access. So good on you guys. That's really next level. Well, let's just say to, to draw it back to what we were talking about earlier, this is a risk that we can make peace with. Mm -hmm. Again, not everyone's there yet. So right, right. Um, it's not, I want to point out that you're, you're making a really great point that this is a larger system that we can leverage. That's just one of our privileges. And this is one we're comfortable leveraging. Mm -hmm. And so I think when people really tally up all their privileges and access to different forms of wealth, be it time, energy, money, land, education, able-mindedness, you start adding all these things up and you think, oh, well, if I leveraged one of these a little bit, I think that's a pretty radical notion. And we're getting closer to filling that gap of alienation. Yeah. I will say a big folly of mine, and I'm embarrassed to admit, this is only like in the last couple of years have I really come to also learn um, so we started at the beginning of this conversation talking about the awe of nature and how the splendor of the natural world almost compels most of us to be drawn to that. And so I, for a long time, I carried around the assumption, who couldn't feel peaceful, restored, and fabulous, frankly, in a peaceful, forested, mountainous valley overlooking a big river next to the largest inland lake in the world with some of the oldest growth forests with fungus abundant everywhere, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Well, Sounds what, like a paradise. Severe over, what a severe overlooking on my part, though. I wasn't considering folks who have never seen the darkness of a, a rural area. Mm -hmm. I wasn't considering perhaps my non neuronormative community who struggles with things that feel outside of their own mechanisms of control. How dare I not consider folks who aren't able bodied, who might be terrified at having to get themselves into a social situation where they have to sit back and say, I actually can't participate in this because this isn't accessible to me anymore. How many people think I can't go and be peaceful and restful. I'll have anxiety so bad because my childcare is costing me a fortune right now. Yeah. It's been this slow awakening of I was propagating my own reality. My truth is me from myself, Amber, I can't imagine nature not being peaceful. But I was taking the strategy that I was going to apply that to everyone else's sense of the world. And I can tell you, it can be really scary when you're standing in the middle of a forest with wolves and cougars and bears and pine martens and eagles. And it's the winter and it's 530 at night and you can't see your hand six inches from your face. We started right before our interview talking about there might be some uncomfortable realities we come face to face with. And I think you just brought up one of mine, which is I like to, prop <laughs> I like to propagate the idea, get outside, get in nature, find mushrooms. It's all going to be therapeutic. But yeah, there might be people where that just isn't the case. They might not share my truth. So that's really important to consider. Well, I think when we're inspired people, when we have these experiences that bring us great passion and joy and a sense of connectedness and well-being, it's almost impossible to not radiate that energy and that message. Right. And when we find something that is that deeply gratifying, I believe it's very very much from a place of a desire to help others find a path to peace as well. 
But intentions aside, when that glow from us is so big that we're not able to listen to the possible realities of other people, Mm. then what often happens, I think, we don't actually often exchange with the people who might not share that viewpoint with us. And I find this both a deeply beautiful and a deeply troubling thing. When we started getting more into the mycelial community, we were sucked down this wormhole of thousands of people who shared this singular passion. I mean, I know birders have their clubs and, you know, whitewater rafters can get real bonkers together. But the mycology community is one of the most fanatic, excited, passionate group of people I have ever dipped my toe in. Yeah. The beauty of that is for many years, I got lost deep in the books and the forests, and I was peacefully in my own mycological trance. And uh, a consequence of that was I wasn't listening to many voices outside of that. So I don't have any guilt or shame about, about that experience. And I would invite you also to consider the place from which you're moving to share that love of mycology. Right. It's contagious. It's magical. You know, right. it's, it's a beautiful, wonderful thing. And then when I consider all of the folks that I haven't perhaps invited and created systems that include them authentically, Yes. Then I'm excited again. I'm like, wow, there's so many doors I have yet to open. There's so many narrow pathways that I dodged through while avoiding this larger focus, which is for this to be part of everyone's possible reality. And maybe that's too tantamount and unrealistic of a goal. I hear that. But I think that if we set that goal very, very high and we try to accommodate and gently include as many people from different sectors and walks of life and pick which demographic, you know, people are very complex. So yeah. you, we can so very quickly try to make our own assumptions about what a person with a walking device might need. But isn't it far more impactful if we just invite them up here and ask them to tell us? how we could be a space that's more inclusive for them to listen to their voice rather than to try to recreate it without actually having the engagement. Well, and I think that gets at the heart of what I would call the great work, which is to channel your passion and your gifts and all these things that you're radiating out to the world and channeling that to be as inclusive as possible and kind of breaking out of some of that modality, which we all fall into, which is to find the group that shares you know, those passions or those gifts and then only associate with them. It's like, no, the great work is to bring that to wider and wider and wider spheres and figuring out how your passions and your gifts can be transmuted over time to gradually be more and more and more inclusive and have a bigger, bigger, more impactful radius. So uh, I don't I don't think that is aiming too high. I think that is really what we're put on the planet to do is to share those gifts and those passions with as many people as possible and include them. I think you discover the thing that you can leverage. And sometimes it doesn't even have to be just a different mindset. It can be folks who are like-minded, but see things differently because of their own unique, their own unique experiences. So like thinking about you, Darren, for example, it would be really wonderful if perhaps you made it an intention to invite a black or indigenous, any people of color specifically to talk about mycology, because there are certainly those folks out there. And it doesn't have to be a forward message, but perhaps it's some part of you realizes, oh, maybe we're not passing the mic to our indigenous brothers and sisters enough, or perhaps we're not talking to our black or brown and the the web grows just like that just with the invitation of a speaker that was a big one for me to make sure that not only was i getting female voices which i really tried to get a lot of female voices on the show but also to engage with the poc and the indigenous community and so luckily we have set that intention and we've been rewarded with folks being willing to come on but it's a constant work right it's a constant work to make sure you're being as inclusive as possible and getting all these different perspectives that help me more finely tune my own work. So it's really powerful stuff. I love the message that you're sharing there. I think that's going to cause a lot of introspection for people. Yeah, just 
a lot of food for thought there in terms of perspective. I do want to talk a little bit about, obviously you talked about it's a 40 acre space. We talked about some of what you do, but what's a quick overview of what you guys do on Moon Mountain between permaculture, foraging, all that good stuff, just to give us a, a little insight, maybe day in the life and, and see what Moon Mountain's like. Interesting. So a day in the life, I'm going to take away any hope for a routine because there is no such thing. <laughs> So it is worth backing up and acknowledging we are on indigenous land, the Anishinaabe community. We are in Marquette County of the Upper Peninsula, what's now called Michigan. And for an interesting sort of larger picture, we're in the Boreal Forests. We're up at about a thousand feet. So we're looking at pine and maple and oak stands. Mm. If you go slightly down in elevation you hit the hemlocks and the cedars and you go up a little higher and you're hitting strictly pine and juniper and such so we're straddled on this south facing mountain face looking into the foothills of the huron mountain range this is a very very rugged and remote part of the united states it's one of the least developed areas on this side of the mississippi and Though a thousand feet to our, our Western listeners and some of our Eastern folks like will say a thousand feet, that's hilarious. That's not anything. But for a place like Michigan, that's quite an elevation. And these mountains are so rounded now from the beauty of the, the glacial shields moving across. So we have these stunning pink and blue and gray granite outcroppings on our northern side with these phenomenal glacial scars and all kinds of fossil history embedded into the top of it. And from where we stand, we can see a few beautiful inland lakes and then Lake Superior. And so we're less than five miles from the shores of Superior. And we can look across the waters and actually see Copper Harbor and the Keweenaw Peninsula. So from a thousand feet, you can see really, really far. Yeah. So obviously we do our gardening on the south facing slope. And on the 40 acre parcel, we have maybe two and a half acres chiseled out for intentional food cultivation. And we and you and, you know, many other people, we use the terms biodynamics and permaculture, but those are just sort of a lens that was applied by a few thinkers and academics to a whole place based culture. For indigenous communities, those are ways of life, not academic studies or something you get a certificate in. So the things that we participate in have very ancient origins, things like polyculture, agroforestry, lunar observation, crop rotation, water harvesting. Those were not colonial tendencies with the garden. The right. Eurocentric gardens were very manicured, organized, lawn based systems, largely for aesthetic, not for the reciprocity of the entire system, not forming a relationship in a deep, harmonious, interconnected way. So we are using a lot of indigenous farming techniques here. We're also incorporating many colonial ones. So we have a blend of the old and the new in a certain regard. We don't use any synthetic chemicals of any kind. And we do things sort of low and slow. So for instance, we're really focused on closed loop agriculture. So at this time, we don't have any animals as we are using green manures and the spreading and saving of seed to increase fertility on this sandy side until we have enough greens and grazing for then animals to come in where we don't have to supplement feeding. So right. we're going into year six of that now. And I can tell you, I'm looking across the second cutting of hay at this point. And it's a, when I say, hay, it's very diverse. It's dandelion and St. John's wort and a variety of grasses and yarrow and mints and some wild raspberries. And those can really get ahead of you if you don't, if you don't keep up with those. Monarda, things like that. So it's a very 
diversified field at this point, which was once a sand pit when we got here. So wow. yes, it took us six years. Yes, admittedly. Well, we're, we're going into our sixth year here. Many folks would say, well, if you just would have shipped in the manure first and shipped in the right. seed, you could have jump started the whole thing. And it's not to say that we feel we've arrived at the best or the only option. It, it's worth pointing out that finding a relationship with the land is your own personal thing. And anything that I say that worked for us here or that we enjoy doing here, it's not necessarily something that I'm advocating as advice to someone else somewhere else. Yeah. So seed saving and using scything and green manures, frankly, might be dangerous in a place that doesn't have access to food security at all. And in that case, I probably would say, let's get seeds in the ground tomorrow. Let's work yeah, on that yeah. right away. We don't have the privilege to wait a few seasons of saving ideal seed. So on anything that I say that we do here and in any given day, it's just what works for us here now at this moment in time and it's ever evolving so now we're scything and that's a beautiful thing we didn't we weren't doing that three years ago we have a, a small seed starting structure that also gives us some season extension which is really wonderful we get to keep greens into the cooler parts of the year and start everything earlier our growing season here is depending on where you're at between 90 and 110 days but you're really flirting with that. It's, it's not a breeze to do longer crops like onions and Brussels sprouts and, and such. We have a, a really short, ferocious season. So this week's weather, for example, it was 90, high 90s in the middle of the early part of the week. And the next day, it was 40 all day long. So we get wow. these extreme highs and these extreme lows. Yeah. And it's, it's a really fun thing. A lot of visitors who come, they say, well, I read it on the things to expect, but I didn't believe that you could average 50 degree temperature drops in any given day. Well, okay, so maybe that's terrible for domesticated crops. It's phenomenal for fungus. Yes, of course, cold snaps, yeah. Big time cold snaps. So while we were renters, we didn't have a lot of capital motivation to invest in somebody else's property at that time. Mm -hmm. We were um, definitely in a pinch. And so we thought, well, we can wander these woods. We are very fortunate to have access to thousands and thousands of acres of land. There's big environmentalists in the community who create community spaces. So they buy privately owned land and make it community owned. Oh, that's fantastic. It is fantastic that we you know one of the big privileges of living in the Upper Peninsula is there's vast amounts of land and very few people. Yeah. So the foraging here is unbelievable. You can hike for hours and never see another person, hear a car, hear a plane. It's one of the few places in the United States that I've had the chance to experience that near bodies of fresh water. Yeah, what a unique experience hunting mushrooms. Now, are we entering your prime mushroom season now or when is the mushroom season there? Yeah, also no no set thing on that. We have experienced such variance in the communication from mushrooms here. Mm. We are entering definitely the beginning of the hardier parts of the foraging season here but i will say we've definitely had winters with let's say turkey tail and chaga that have been more bountiful than the early parts of summer everything here seems to work on a slower clock the patterns aren't annual and we're not learned enough in the slower patterns of these big forests. And I think that that's part of protection of the mushroom knowledge is that because these forests are such dense, massive bodies, and they're connected by these corridors of old growth, they're not fast moving, they're very slow moving. So if you're in your little community woodlot, you're very likely to see a quick change in weather have almost immediate and predictable circumstances. But when you're talking about trekking into a 500 acre parcel, what the outer rim of that 
effect that forest has experienced versus different elevations or densities, you're hitting entirely different micro zones within an hour walk. And it gets into this interesting concept as more and more we see forests or certain areas of forests as these kind of phyto regions or even these organisms that are on their own time scale obviously they're much larger than us and so it's this exercise it sounds like of understanding the cycles of this wholly different non-human organism that's something else i've been toying with recently is our desire to see everything even through a human lens when these beings these systems are decidedly not human they don't have regard for our ideas of regularity or <laughs> timing yeah there's a lot a lot to learn there where you guys are, it sounds like, even relative to the rest of the United States where we don't often get giant untouched stands like that. Absolutely. It's cultivating listening constantly, taking in all the clues that are being given. You know, the, yeah. the teachings are happening. The learning is always happening. But the listening really accelerates the intensity of the lessons that you're hearing exercising that patience and listening like you were talking about earlier that is not always valued enough. Now, were you much of a mycophile before moving to where you are now in Michigan before, I guess, six years ago? Were you really into mycology? Did this jumpstart you? What was that uh, journey like? Well, like many of the folks you've invited on, not surprisingly, my first gateway into the mycological realm was through psilocybin mushrooms. Sure. And this was while I was on one of those paths of questioning. That experience did not offer me any answers. It offered me more questions. That was a really beautiful part of recalibrating my compass and feeling called closer to mushrooms but I, I couldn't have named it that way at that time because I, my life was still so severely mirroring a mother culture's reflection than my own. Mm. And I had a few more experiences that were equally as therapeutic and powerful. And it became unquestionable that there was a relationship to be explored there and that it was a large gap in my understanding of other relations. Right. And still shrouded in mystery. It sounds like to what that path would look like. Absolutely. So I know that many different cultures have many different rites of passage with entheogens. And I think mm -hmm. that's something that is a, an egregious missing component in U S American culture is often these sacred points of entry into a spiritual realm or or just something outside of your neuronormative experience. And we don't have wisdom being imparted to us from an elder. Mm. Yes. I that's... believe that if we had more respect for those who are experienced in these sorts of things. You know, I, I would say um, mushrooms are very feared still, by and large. Whether you're talking mycophobia of culinary mushrooms or whether you're looking at it from a culinary or a cultural revolution standpoint, I think that we're still not in a place where we give reverence and respect for those who have the, these knowledge systems mm -hmm. from all over the world. And I enjoy doing so many things in a given day. And the world of mycology is so expansive and massive that I realized I could spend the totality of the rest of my life focusing only on mushrooms. And I would be a fool to believe I could come to understand them in that short duration of time. Right. So the fact that my interests are varied means that in reality, I'm going to learn a little about a lot of things. And this is one of the really interesting concepts about these nuclear family farm systems that we've had in America. So let's say you're a potato farmer and you grow for 35 years. That's only 35 chances you got to identify what the best methodology of producing that starch in your community is. Right, right. 
And if your children or, or whomever you're handing this farm down to is not interested in picking up your line of work, where does that history go? And that's a very modern example. And I think that nuclear family farms are very dangerous in being centers that protect and accumulate wealth by a few elite people in communities. I think if we begin to, instead of, I, I see this a lot in, you know, the mushroom movement and the food movements is a certain degree of food elitism that, that rises. Mm -hmm. And I think that as an informed consumer, you want to buy organic and you want to purchase things locally from your small farmer. But we often don't just give praise for the one example. It often comes at the vilification of the how do you say the opposite? Then we'll say, oh, well, that's conventional lettuce. Right, I'm not right. going to. And they're very helpful things to distinguish between if you're trying to make an informed decision. But in the judgment of the options that we believe aren't the best preferences for us, we're crediting an entire lifetime of human experience, which has witnessed and seen things. So I can tell you that I've spent a lot of time with folks who we don't have very similarly equal mindsets about things and we'll be talking about because a lot of what we do here is perennial cropping so mm -hmm. we'll talk to different farmers about their orchard systems and the old timers by and large spray and it's interesting because it, mushrooms seem to be this topic that is so profoundly misunderstood that Everyone is allowed to bring their radical hypotheses about things to light. And it's this beautiful bridge between varying opinions about a similar thing. So I can, this, this farmer can say to me, you know, miss, you're nuts. You're never going to be able to grow these apples without spraying this copper sulfide or whatever they're, they're applying. Right. And I can say, did you notice the chanterelles are up right now? Boom, we've switched topics and yeah, you know, I saw them down by the river. It's definitely <laughs> going to be a good year for them. And, and it's this, it's this white flag. It's like, uh, predicting the weather then, you know, it's like, well, you've got a 50% chance of being wrong and I'm still going to be happy we have this conversation. That, that you don't find that as true as much in the cultivation of food world. There are a lot of experts and there are, there are a lot of people who are going to tell you there's only one really right way to do this. And in that rigidity and that ego forward mindset, we forget to embrace the mystery in all of these things. But mushrooms, they're, the, they're like the mascot of mystery. So they get to be this topic with amateur foragers and young mycologists as, well, let's pass around ideas that maybe don't feel authentic or like our own, but I'm not going to totally discredit it. I've thought about this a lot, and I think it's great to bring up this distinction where the discussion of mycology and mushrooms feels more open source uh, in terms of a discipline of study or a discipline of science than almost any other. It feels very open source, open to everyone's ideas. And I've often thought, you know, how that is such a great relationship to the actual form of fungi. You know, mycelium is this connecting thread lacing through all basically all living things, but especially in a forest under the forest floor, it laces through everything and is indistinguishable from the root fibers and infects in a tree and it becomes part of everything. So it's like this, this symbol of connection. And I find, like you said, when you bring it up in conversation, it ends up connecting you with someone, even if there are differences of opinion, even if there are knowledge gaps, it's like this area of definite connection. And I do hope we can take some of that feeling or that energy and start applying it to these other things like you're saying and recognize well mushrooms or study of mycology doesn't have to be the only place where we show this level of of kind of coming together and loosen our rigidity of our ideas this should be applied to you know cultivation of other food crops this should be applied to basically every area of our life we should have that kind of fluidity to honor the mystery and realize that our truth might not be the truth it might be our truth when it comes to the ways to do certain things and really embrace some of that mentality outside of just mushrooms. So I think it's really great to bring up that theme because I find that with almost everyone I talk to, whether they're professional mm. mycologist or day one forager, everyone's open and connecting. There is 
less of the elitism and knowledge hoarding and more of kind of the open source model, which I really like. Now, that's not strictly true. There are some people that want to keep all their mushroom knowledge and look down on people. I, I know I've heard it happens, but my experience has always been a, a much more open model than that. Yeah, I really appreciate you sharing all that. I think that's a great reflection. And, you know, it reminds me also a bit of anthropology. So being up here in, in an old place, you know, there's a lot of, we're, we're on this Precambrian shield, you know, part of the Canadian shield. And so this is some of the oldest rock on earth. And we've got these phenomenal mineral deposits. And part of the lure of the Huron Mountains is there's this called the Huron Mountain Club. And it's a very private place. And it encompasses the majority of the Huron Mountain Range. And it has, it has been preserved unbelievably. And there are a lot of problems with conservation. You know, it's deeply rooted in the displacement. Well, both the displacement first, and then consequently the dispossession of indigenous people. You know, right. Yellowstone was formed with this intention of preserving wilderness. And in reality, it forced indigenous communities into concentration camps on 40 acre parcels. And we, we cheer and we revere for these national park systems without ever even actually acknowledging the origin of it as genocide based. So as much as I can say what a wonderful community thing it is that we have somewhere around 30,000 acres of untouched land, there were people there that had connections with that space. Right. And I talked to many indigenous people who say white folks have this sense that the land was wild in the sense that there weren't people in relationship with that land with what we would call cultivation techniques right. and indigenous groups say, Hey, what are you talking about? We were doing seed saving. We were planting gardening gardens. We were doing crop rotations. We had polyculture. We had agroforestry. We were doing water harvesting and intentional burns and managing herds. So we took this notion of, well, wild means no human involvement. Right. which is largely not true. And here in my own community, we see that because there's this phenomenal series of mountains that collect together. And then there's a dolmen on top of mountain. And these are monolithic rock structures and formations from thousands of years BCE. And going back to the embracing of mystery, in anthropology, it's not agreed upon the sole purpose of these dolmens. Was it for communication? Was it a sacred ceremonial space? There are many hypotheses that are allowed to coexist yeah. within the academic study of these. Now, if you talk to the folks who were uprooted from those places, they're likely not going to tell you what it is because that's something they're going to protect for their culture. Or they don't often even get a chance to speak and be heard about what those sacred spaces might mean to them. So you consider that mushrooms are also similar to the stories, right? We're talking about these old concepts, the stories that people tell over time, the oral histories. Right. The mycelium weaves many things and many concepts together, and so do our stories, so do our mm. narratives. Mm. And so telling stories about mushrooms is this unification and coalescing of two places that allow for hope and creativity and ingenuity and imagination and play and wonder. And we find that to be a very scarce and sacred experience. So much of what happens at Moon Mountain it could be a small wild foray. It could be a small dinner party. Maybe we're hosting a group of people to have a conversation about fermentation. It can be under the guise of many different activities of why we're gathering together. But it's inevitably with the hope of interweaving stories and narratives and often doing so around mushrooms and food systems and nature and ecology. Mushrooms are just sort of this wonderful champion and warrior and, and mascot of mystery. I know that's so hokey and I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to hear myself later and I'm going to be like, wow, you really said mushrooms are the mascots of mystery. 
And I'm not doing that for alliteration. I was going to say it's alliterative and catchy. (laughs) And I can see the brand already. Mascots of mystery. Um, But it's it's true. And I found a lot of power. Obviously, I'm doing a podcast in sharing stories entwined around mushrooms and that that can infuse other aspects of our life and leave people feeling inspired. There's an undeniable power and subtler energy in these things than we sometimes consciously realize. And, and I think you're absolutely, I think you're spot on. Now, one central issue that I do want to talk about with you, you brought up a couple of times this issue of reconciling or recognizing our relationship to land that is stolen and a history in America of genocide and removing indigenous people. When did this come so strongly into your awareness and become kind of at the core of how you live out your purpose? Because you're clearly really knowledgeable about it. It's in your consciousness as you make decisions. When did that shift start for you? I'd like to be able to give you a very pinpointed moment in time. However, it's just a voice that I've heard that has just continued to be amplified. Mm -hmm. And that's largely because of the work of other people. You know, one experience that I had that greatly emphasized the importance of this issue was definitely reading Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz's book, Indigenous People's History of the U.S. Mm -hmm. If I had to relate with an element most, I most often feel in relation to fire. And there are very few things that I don't feel called to be almost a warrior with. And there were a lot of incongruencies in my public education experience that felt like there was an unspoken void. I went to a largely white school. The curriculum... I mean, to give you an example, we had to do a sit-in for Martin Luther King Jr. Day to acknowledge that this should be a holiday. And at minimum, if we're not regarding it as a holiday, then the curriculum from that for that day should be entirely centered around that. This is something the students had to take up. So the systems wow. that were already in place were certainly not acknowledging the totality of history in the U.S., So I definitely felt the rage of I didn't get the whole story. I only got part of the story. And these institutions' biases influenced the material that I was exposed to. Keep in mind, I was an 80s baby. So internet came in during my life. I wasn't born with the internet. And I think that that excess, you know, when we would do school projects, I was pulling encyclopedias off shelves. I wasn't punching anything into a keypad until it was time maybe to type the report. I mean, I was doing reports on typewriters before that. (laughs) So we've had a major technological boom to which I'm not sure that level of ignorance would have lasted so long. Right. But I had the, the chance to go to Pine Ridge and engage with the community there. And that was deeply impactful Once my eyes were open to the microaggressions that I was still propagating, as an example, saying something like sitting Indian style, a saying of which I wasn't actually breaking apart the origin of that way of speaking. And I had a young boy say to me, oh, you know, we just say crisscross applesauce as a style of sitting. And I immediately was in that very beginning bubble of realizing that I had a form of racism, which is I felt very uncomfortable. I was in that fear zone of, oh, my gosh, I feel guilty and I've offended. And that, I think, is often the first step into growth and development to being anti-racist is starting from a place of first having your either overt or sometimes, as in this case, subtle forms of white supremacy and racism called in. And we say called in versus called out because that what that young boy did so well was he said, instead of telling you you're wrong, I'm just going to invite you into saying something differently. 
-hmm. He didn't give me a history lesson and he certainly didn't have to because of the gentle and kind way that he called me in and invited me to share in language in a different way. The lesson was given to me in a way of which I was able to receive it. So I have been guilty of calling out, which might have looked like humiliating me in front of the larger group for having an old fashioned way of saying something that's very hurtful towards a marginalized and oppressed group of people. There were thousands of little experiences that had some semblance of things like that, where I witnessed calling ins versus calling outs, or I participated in my own calling out and finding, finding my own way of moving through those, you know, the fear zone, the learning zone, and then the growth zone, which is where I now speak out when I see racism in action, and I can sit with my discomfort. The major part for me of my learning zone was learning how to authentically support my Indigenous community. So when Ryan and I lived in an urban environment, we worked directly with the community members that we were trying to help uplift in a rural area. It's there's a lot of invisibility. Mm. My closest neighbor is not very close at all. And in my own isolation of being in a rugged environment, my immediate hope of action, so to say was, well, I'm going to open the doors and say any folks, any indigenous folks who want to come here, just come here. Right. It's like, well, what kind of long-term relationship is that? And how effective is it really? And are you actually taking a path towards truth and reconciliation and reparations? Or are you just trying to alleviate your discomfort with the fact that you have privileges? Yeah. And so I don't ask what indigenous communities can do for Moon Mountain, I ask, how can we show up for indigenous communities now? And that might just seem like a very subtle difference in the question, but for me, it really changes the framework through which I try to make decisions. So rather than inviting folks out here and asking them to make the trouble of traveling and or figuring out the whole logistics of that, we show up to their events. When they need volunteers for their community events, we volunteer. When local artists put jewelry and crafts and goods up for sale, we support them. When they're seeking donations for a certain drive, we stand up and we show up in that way. When our local high school's mascot is still the Red Eds, with a tribal headdress, we right. speak out and say, no, we need to convert this towards a tribal symbol. We go and attend their wild foraging walks instead of asking them to come be experts at ours. That's big. And I think separating that idea of what you can do for the indigenous community versus what they can do for you gets at the heart of that you know, true intention behind it which again, you explained beautifully that intention of, are you trying to assuage your guilt and you're feeling bad about the privileged position you're in, or are you really trying to help and overcome that and get past that? And it gets to that authenticity because we see a lot of performative things be done, especially when I think of like the corporate world, you know, there's a lot of performative action taken that don't lead to tangible aid and betterment and you know, assistance for these communities and giving platforms and all those kind of important things. I want to nailing the concept of ally versus accomplice. So an, an ally stands for an accomplice stands with. That's a really important distinction because in your allyship, is it becoming a platform for yourself to show how much of an ally you are? Or are you really standing with people to support their platform and almost their elevation you know it's something that as foragers we often don't think about but it's something that's so important because there must have been rich indigenous foraging traditions and so absolutely to have people and obviously it's more complex than this and you know folks nowadays who are foraging aren't responsible directly for the displacement of indigenous people to forage on their lands. But when we go around as forage experts on lands that our ancestors essentially migrated or invaded, there's some disconnect there. 
So there is some disconnect. And it's really interesting with mushrooms because their origins are not as well understood as plants. So mm-hmm. you could say, for instance, if we're talking about leading a wild foray, some indigenous folks, Linda Black Elk, she's a phenomenal botanist and indigenous woman who educates about ethical wild crafting. One of the things that she mentions on some I Collective conversations is there are colonizer plants of origin and there are indigenous plants of origin. And if you can find which plants have similar healing modalities and what ways the plant spirit shows up and is available for you, why don't you then go ahead and leave the native plant for the indigenous community to harvest? And let's go ahead and you work with the plants that your ancestors brought here and you continue to form and nourish that relationship. And then we can coexist together where we're both working with our traditional plants. Yeah. Then you do have some plants like yarrow, which overlap both of those communities, for instance. But then there's mushrooms. Again, we're back to the, the mystery. It's really important then when we consider mushroom harvesting, and we're talking about specifically as well on occupied lands, is that we bring to the forefront just respect and admiration. And I will admit all of the way through, Ryan and I took part in a major folly. When we first came to this community, we noticed that nobody was making wild foraged goods available at the local markets and in the restaurants. And we thought, this seems impossible. You know, we were motivated by watching big culinary shows, you know, Noma and um, right. what's Magnus Fabican's restaurant. And and you, you begin to see, oh, the, the world of food would love to try tender birch sap and young elder leaves. And, and this excitement and this craze came over us. And we did the gold rush thing where we were like, wow, this is, there's so much bounty of mushrooms here. And we were making most of our money selling wild foraged goods to our local community. Then I read Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. And I was moved by her honesty regarding all that is sacred. It's a difficult book to try to put into a single message or ethos, she really, you know, I read the book like a grandma sitting down and telling me all the things that I should have been told long ago. So I don't have the answer for how each person who's foraging in the United States is supposed to approach their mycological adventures. For me, listening and learning from those communities has been profoundly helpful working through my discomfort and my guilt and my shame and taking moments to reflect and meditate on things and sit with mushrooms, even just sit with a flush of mushrooms before harvesting. You know, this is the, this is the hard thing for me to speak much to as I've admitted, right? I have accounting and finance background. I'm a Virgo. I like order and structure. I enjoy putting things into tiny boxes with perfect bows. In right. another, another life, I could have absolutely been an organizer of information by and large, but there's this other side of me, my, my soul, my psyche, my heart center that refuses to be quieted and also feels like the source of that warrior energy that was sparked to explore a deeper curiosity about American history, about global politics, about all of these things that are interconnected to something as simple as going into a forest and harvesting a mushroom. So when you try to tell young folks who see an Instagram photo, and we've been very guilty of this, of, you know, let's say a 40 pound chanterelle flush that's going to make the next six months of bills vanish. You know, living off the grid, we have very little bills. We don't have utilities or something. We're in a handmade cabin. We grow a lot of our own things. That that's not the reason 
to go into Mm. the forest and spend time with the mushrooms. And I know that I have been guilty of propagating that hope in the past. And I know that it's something I still have to put a lot of work and energy into redirecting and calling in in a new way because many of the young travelers who come here are indeed in hopes of converting to a more quiet or rural life or somewhere where they're more interconnected with nature, but they're also able to make a full-time living doing that. And I'll be frank with you, I don't see a path to making a five or six figure income while living in line with the planet in such a simple, rudimentary way. If the needs and the desires stay unchecked and your hope is still to drive a new car and have the latest designer clothes and reach for material goods to to continue to fill that gap of alienation, the foraging becomes extractive. And when Mm -hmm. that extractive ethos is applied to a sacred activity, it's hard to hear the message and the lessons that that life path is providing us. It's not that it cannot happen, it's that it makes it harder. And I was guilty of that. And many people are. And hearing what you're saying, it's not like developing your own relationship with nature and foraging for mushrooms on its own will shift your perspective when it comes to that prioritization of economics over all else or that cultural program that we have. It may not be enough to just overwhelm that and get rid of it. And in fact, your cultural programming, your economic mindset may then affect the practice of communing with nature and foraging with mushrooms and turn that into something that is losing that sacred or that spiritual connection. I bring up a lot of my guests that idea of the spiritual connection you get when you're out in the forest and you find mushrooms. And it is a really good point to bring up that we have to be careful with our economic or extractive mindset when we bring it to that scenario or that space because it can totally change the connection I mean, that we truly want and that truly should be there, which is that sense of gratitude, that sense of spirituality we get in, when being in that natural space and communing with something like mushrooms. So I really appreciate you bringing that up. Now, how have you been received as someone who does want to be an accomplice to indigenous communities? And I'm asking this because I think a lot of people, myself included, who haven't directly engaged with indigenous communities, there's a fear of the unknown. How will I be received? So how have you been received by indigenous communities when you show up to be an accomplice and support them in authentic ways? How have you been received by those communities? My experience by and large has been with open arms and with a Mm. desire to share. However, I have also listened to elder indigenous say, there's a gentleman, Carlos, for example, who says, you don't tell white folks more than you'd tell your younger sibling you don't give them more than they can handle that shows that that's that's not not being welcome but it is also acknowledging that this is going to be many generations yeah of work this is not something that i can step forward and say here i am i'm here to break my ancestral cycles these things are coming to the surface and i'm gonna work towards amending this so snap my fingers boom and we're back on track right it's going to take many generations of all interested individuals coming together and finding reciprocal and meaningful relationships that are mutually beneficial i've I've been very fortunate because we have a man here, Marty Reinhardt, who developed a massive study of indigenous food cultures, and he produced a cookbook called The Decolonizing Diet. <laughs> what a wonderful entry point in this community to be able to go and buy his cookbook and attend his class and listen to what he has to say and share in that invitation to understand what the food systems looked like. So for communities who don't have an open invitation like that, it is harder. Yeah. Which is why I, I've mentioned a few books, because that's low hanging fruit. Right. In this day and age, print information is fairly accessible. And for folks who have different disabilities, 
there are additional audio and mentorship forms of gaining access to that education as well. And so there's another, there's a whole other opportunity for folks who are interested in mycology and making things more widely accessible is what do we do for folks who have a difficult time using a cell phone or a laptop as a way of extracting copious amounts of information in a very short amount of time? How are we including them in this new path? You know, this, this little sliver of a path that I'm on and we can call it outreach and education and growth and sacred space sharing. I don't want to say that it's insignificant, but it is not going to have a lasting impact if it stands as an island unto itself. It's like a puzzle piece. I mean, there's a lot of other pieces that need to come into this. It's one Absolutely. part of the solution. Otherwise, it won't not only happen across multiple generations, but it won't be shaped by the other community members who are looking to be in respectful reciprocity as well. So it, yeah. it will fail in the mission by attempting to be by itself. And I love the point you make about the intergenerational nature of this. And you find that with so many things when it comes to healing traumatic realities of our past is it doesn't happen in our lifetime. It's so hard for us as beings to grapple with is the idea that during my lifetime, the work I begin will, will not come to fruition. Like this is gonna be the starting of a foundation that other people will build upon and build upon and build upon. And when we have something like this, it's an, a distressing injustice that's in our cultural memory and that we can now see the reprehensible moral nature of it. It's like, we want to just have that fixed and go away and we want to feel better about it. It's like, man, it might be a lifetime of feeling uncomfortable, know there was wrong that was committed and that the onus is on us to start that process of learning and supporting and understanding. And by the end of it, we might not be, you know, even that much further to the finish line. And it's going to take a long, a long time, but I love that you've given some advice for people who just want to get started on this path, who feel for some people it's indignation, for some people it's anxiety about this relationship that's undeniable with being Western European white people living on the land that is America. And you've given us some steps to get us going because it is well, going to be I, a quantum. I do of want people. to clarify. I hope that I'm not too much attempting to clarify the indigenous community because I'd rather amplify their voices to speak for themselves. More so what I might hope that the tone of the message is understanding white supremacy and racism and how we can situate ourselves to have more open conversations about these things. Because I think that the, the time is now we are in the middle of a massive Black Lives Matter movement. This is happening. This is a historical moment. And the reality that it will be intergenerational, when you consider the reciprocal relationship of a mushroom, I don't believe that a mushroom feels bad when, you know, they fruit and cast the spores of which they will not see the fruit of right, right and when the tree falls that becomes host to those decomposing allies i don't see the tree as going oh no i've failed i'm <laughs> i'm i'm now at the bottom of the food chain is it the bottom or is it the top and so my hope or my prayer is that instead of trying to find at which place we're at in this cycle that we just jump in and we participate in it. And I think it's a really beautiful thing that we have, that I have had the opportunity to be included in conversations with indigenous people. And as a thing I would say as advice, some unsolicited advice, I would say not to do is do not bombard your indigenous or people of color communities, asking them what to do. Right. When you do this work with yourself enough, the solutions that are available to you, right, we talked about at the beginning of this conversation, the things of which you can leverage that you can also live with, they become very clear and obvious to you. It's not the job of the oppressed to uplift the oppressor. 
there's an inextricable violence there in, in putting the workload on those who are suffering the consequence of this institutional reality. I want to say maybe I've given a little advice about what to do when it's applicable in each person's situation, but more strongly, don't bother these folks. Do your own work. There's not a get out of jail free card on this. It's not easy. And if all you get through in your experience of consciousness on this earth is moving past guilt and shame, bravo. You've shown up, you're doing the work, and you're having some participation in the evolution of these topics. And thank you for doing that work. You know, I will say, Darren, it might not be a bad idea to put a trigger warning for folks at the beginning of this podcast, because some of these topics can be very isolating and emotionally traumatizing for people to discuss. Absolutely. Well, in my own stuff comes up around it because I share in a Western European heritage, you know, to some extent. And this is, this does trigger all those feelings I was talking about, the anxiety, the indignation, the, you know, that feeling of what do I do about this? How do I turn around? How do I stop the oppression or stop the cultural injustices or systemic injustices that, you know, I wasn't even cognizant of for a lot of my life and how do sure. I get over that embarrassment? How do So I like what you're saying and that the work is to do for folks that are part of the white community who are the dominant culture that has put America where it is now. The onus falls on us to do the inner work and deal with that in ourselves. And then I love that idea that then the path becomes apparent of what you can do. It's not sit with all these feelings for five minutes and run over to the nearest POC indigenous community and say, let me help you to assuage. It's like, you have to do that work in yourself, come to peace with some of these huge issues and at the core of what our culture is and maybe what you are as a product of the culture and then start deriving your own solutions and really bring those to the party of this whole movement. Beautifully said, beautifully said. And for many of us, mushrooms have been the path to really peacefully deconstruct and unpack some of those concepts. Yeah. It's interesting that as an interest or as a passion for people, a connection with mushrooms and thereby a bigger connection with nature seems to inculcate more awareness and consciousness about these issues naturally. Now, maybe it's just because people who are naturally more open to understanding these issues we're talking about are more likely to resonate with nature and mushrooms. I'm not sure the causality there, but part of me wants to think that as you learn an appreciation for these other amazing living things, you are forced to become conscious of your relationship with other humans and your relationship with your greater culture. And it kind of highlights some of these big issues that we're talking about. It's a vector to start participating in this cycle of healing. And it's very hopeful. It's a very hopeful notion that if spending a few minutes with your own thoughts could lead to the long-term improvement of human welfare and social justice, well, geez, that's a pretty peachy (laughs) future. With everything going on right now, to to think that self-care could be a radical form of transformation to do that healing with yourself could lead to a long term revolution. I think that's a cause worthy of spreading across all all ways of being. And if it's within a mycological community, well, then I expect that to just mushroom and blossom further and faster, because that's what this community really is good at, is just like the mycelial web disseminating incredible amounts of information, being very beneficial and kind and reciprocal. And I think these are the very you know, attributes that we can embody and embrace if we simply love the mushrooms in the same way if we could learn to love ourselves. And I think I have seen a strong resonance with the entire mycological community and have been impressed with how they've shown up during this period of, you know, hyper awareness around this issue of racial injustice. I feel like the mycological community has showed up or at least tried to show up in very real ways. And I think that probably has no small part to do with our obsession with fungi and trying to model our behavior after them. Absolutely. And cheers to all the the growth and improvement. We still have to go. 
I'm getting more excited for it as I talk to you. I'm getting more excited for that journey. So this, this may be too large a question, but do you see a reconciliation of European cultures and indigenous cultures and POC or more specifically black cultures in America as being possible? I mean, is that something where we can leave behind the microaggressions we can leave behind the systemic issues like i said this is a huge question but is this is that something that you see as a possible future within you know the next 100 200 years well to break that down a bit when we talk about reconciliation i think it's often widely discussed that that starts with truth and the discussion of agreed upon historical events. And I believe that before reconciliation is something that we're gonna see on the horizon, we have to first disseminate truth. What, what is that saying? You can convince some of the people of some all of, of the, the things, some of the time, but not all of the people, all the things all the time, right? right. I botched that saying. Clearly, I don't use it much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was right there with you. I was like, that sounds right. Yeah, that's great. But, you know, no one person can represent a whole group of people and no whole group of people can take on the mental representation of one person. What reconciliation might look like for one indigenous person might not look anything like a young black person. What reparations might look like for one audience might not look anything like another's. So these are going to be... I think truth is the first pass. And then I think reconciliation will begin to beam its light over the horizon as we get closer and closer to that precipice of a new understanding. Mm. I think reconciliation is absolutely possible. I think that it, as we've discussed, it's going to take many generations and it's going to take a lot of the thing that comes to mind is trial and error, but I don't actually like that conjugation of things. I think it's going to take humility and trust. So there are going to be some people who do not want to bridge that gap. The scars of trauma are so deep or too new or they're not comfortable. And that's an acceptance that has to be given validity is that consent is going to be a very critical part of reconciliation. And for some folks coming to the table and reconciling is not going to be on the menu. Right. It has to be participatory. Both sides have to want to agree to be there or we're subjugating them to the white savior phenomenon. Exactly. That's what I was getting at is how we can achieve this kind of reconciliation without some kind of white savior complex getting overlaid. And I like that idea that we have to, I think what you're highlighting too is a big amount of courage and openness to try to bridge that gap and be willing to understand it might not be reciprocated. And that has to be valid. You know, if it's a, a person, absolutely valid. If person is too traumatized and too affected by past events, you have to understand that their response can be to not reciprocate your openness and desire to connect and heal. I think we see that sometimes we understand that in our interpersonal relationships. And then when you zoom out to this big social level, we lose that a bit. But, you know, I see a lot of this when you think about people with damaged relationships due to past trauma and, you know, they all have to be worked out. And sometimes it just can't be because the trauma was too great. And we need to, we need to have that level of understanding. And empathy as well, because I think it is part of the universal human experience to have trauma and have suffering and misfortune. And I hear many folks say, well, why are we giving all this attention to one form of trauma when there's so many to get into? And to that, I say, we need to amplify the things that have been deliberately suppressed to bring it to equal playing field and maybe from that center of hurt and our own trauma and experience, we can draw upon empathy and use that felt sense to imagine how difficult it might be. And to also know we can't understand how difficult it might be, but if we can draw upon those reserves of our own experience to imagine 
meaning to meditate, to contemplate, to sit with, to try to envision, not to be able to articulate back to them their exact experience, but rather to connect in a meaningful, authentic way, you're moved to desire mutual collaboration and consent more than propagating your own agenda. Right. Because otherwise you're back into a forceful role, right? We see this concept, in this hierarchy of what do workers want to become? They want to become the boss. We hmm. see this prevalent in all kinds of things, right? Hip hop culture, right? Cardi B, she's like, in one of her songs, and she's very well listened to, she's like, you're a worker, I'm a boss. And right. people listen to that song and we're like, yes, one day I'm going to be the boss. I'm going to have the hierarchy where I own the capital and I dictate the form of management and I can hire and fire at will. And then you step back and you're like, well, wait, I was the worker once. Why do I want to go from the oppressed to the oppressor? That's a really violent link where they're inextricably exchanging in the same culture. And we're talking about especially you and I right now, Darren, we're talking about something that diverges from that path. So right. maybe like, instead of saying like, I want to be the boss, maybe it's like, I want to be the co-creator. I want to be the co-captain. Yeah. I want to be a collaborator. We're together in this. This is a co-opted network. This is not a hierarchy of ownership and power. For me, you know, a big thing was I see as part of the eventual reconciliation. It's like, man, people need access to land and all the resources, the, the real wealth, not as, not even necessarily money, but all the real wealth that is predominantly- The knowledge, the yeah, time. Exactly, the, the time, the time, attention, the energy, the land that is predominantly in the hands of like this white, almost aristocracy needs to be distributed amongst people to have any hope of reconciliations and equality. And so I think you put that really well about changing these bigger social structures to fix some of these social symptoms that we're seeing. And I feel like we are reaching a good critical mass around this. There are mm -hmm. a lot of people who are, maybe this is a poor term, but who are having an awakening and enlightenment. They're having a realization, something's shifting, something's changing. And that can definitely be hard on the nervous system. It can evoke the depression, the anxiety, the alienation, which we've heavily discussed. But mm -hmm. I think it's also equally important and powerful to discuss all the excitement and creativity and ecstatic joy that can emerge from this new structure to take one down and to replace it with another that's a stronger foundation is a really I, I keep using the word exciting but that's all I can think of because mm -hmm. I'm equally as nervous right I've got that butterfly feeling where it's new it's fresh it's something that I'm eager for I think exciting encapsulate that encapsulates that notion that it, it does spike my nervous system. I do feel my felt body get tingly and it's firing and I'm like, yeah, I'm ready to go. Let's do this. Hip, hip, hooray. And I know that sounds hokey and silly, but it is that innocent place of moving from love and respect and admiration for a better future. It's not only purposeful and a great call to work for each of us to do, but it is returning us back to that soul-centered, innocent place where we explore curiosity and we fill our pockets with shells and stones and we encourage that in others and we make room for alternative viewpoints and eventually shift the paradigm to the point that they're not alternative anymore. Yes, and the natural world is all about systems of change. So it is incredibly exciting to feel like we are part of that. Uh, As so, we are, yeah. And it's, so it's undeniable. <laughs> so this that's infectious. And I, I appreciate you sharing that with us and kind of putting some of these things in even a new light and the most positive way of looking at it. So much to think about. I appreciate you being so generous with your time and sharing your insights. Are there any future plans at Moon Mountain, anything you're excited just to mention? And then I want you to let people know uh, where they can find you. The future is as uncertain as <laughs> right. any right. other future. 
I can say that for many years, we've had documents about our courses of action to inclusivity and diversity and greater accessibility. And we've not seen clear paths to how we're going to achieve those. It's too soon yet to entirely speak. I, I find this concept of don't talk about something until it's happening because mm -hmm. life can happen and all of a sudden this thing that you thought was definitely going to happen tomorrow doesn't happen tomorrow but you've told the world hey tomorrow <laughs> yes i'm gonna do this thing we've all been so there I, i'm gonna patiently wait for the moment things are to fruition and people can follow us on Instagram at moonmountain.mi, and we abbreviate mountain, MTN, or at moonmountain.com. Again, same thing, abbreviation, moon, MTN. And I can say what we just wrapped up yesterday is a new pathway to get into the off-grid cabin for folks with different walking assistance needs. So now we have an off-grid cabin that is completely ADA accessible. That has been a process which is a little bit more inclusive than I'm going to drag out into detail. But to be frank, that was something I thought we could have achieved in one year. So things move at their own time scale. We're now five years going into our sixth year in. And I'm learning to accept that the things that I hope to see come to fruition might take longer than I imagine. But I think like the forests show many good things do work on slower and longer time scales. Yeah. So there's big things happening out here, but they're moving at a pace that is sustainable and still authentic. I like that. Not all growth is linear. And I heard someone once say that, you know, it's kind of like fermentation. Sometimes it feels like nothing's happening, but really the energies are all coalescing and it's just about to do what you want to do. So that's very cool. I do encourage people to follow you. There's a lot of inspiration there. And then because this is Mushroom Hour, I do want to know what is a mushroom that you love and why? And this doesn't have to be a favorite, anything like that. It could just be, you know, for the next five minutes. What's a mushroom you love and why? And why should we know about it? A mushroom I love. I'm glad you didn't say favorite because that's a trick question. Favorite's way too hard. People are like, these are my, ch that's like asking me to pick a favorite child. Like, <laughs> Absolutely. A mushroom that really has my attention right now in this moment Perfect. are the garden giants, the wine caps. People might say, oh, lame. You live in a place with so many mushroom varieties. How are you going to pick the one that everybody knows? I truly was unaware of their incredible ability to propagate in such a short period of time. We have inoculated a small garden bed a year ago. And within one season, we are seeing the very same mushrooms pop up over 100 yards away. Wow. Working through the wood chips and the mulching and spreading the spores on the wind to the point that we now have so many wine caps, we're able to give them away from a place of abundance. And for us, it's a really wonderful choice culinary mushroom to help break down the stigmas of mycophobia. It's beautiful because of its commonness. People are less afraid. If, if I'm when I say these came from my garden, rather than these came from the forest, people don't ask if they're going to have an out of body experience or die. <laughs> right, right. So it's, I'm learning our quieter and maybe more common fungal allies have a lot to teach us. And they're just as exciting as some of the, the rare cordyceps we find or the the less common trumpets or the chanterelles that shouldn't be growing there or sure. the elusive morels that we just love to see here in the midwest and have a fanatical appreciation for and because of the strafaria's ability to thrive the way it does it makes it a phenomenal mushroom to be recommended in almost any person's growing environment even if it was your old tomato pot on your balcony in new york city you can grow them there it's worth saying it's a great entry point mushroom 
though I have had some profound and powerful experiences on psilocybin, I would not make the recommendation that people's entry level to the mycological world is through entheogens because we don't have those rites of passage. We don't have those elders to teach us the sacred nature of it. The culinary world is a phenomenal way to tickle all of your senses, to connect with the larger sphere of what's going on around us, to expand your taste buds, to feel a different texture than anything else you're going to find in a grocery store or supermarket or farm market, to smell an earthy bodily scent that is not going to be in a perfume or any other type of fruit body. And if you can meditate and sit, I dare you can even listen to these mushrooms. So this is a this is an all senses inclusive, totally accessible garden ally that is eager to be seen. It's a very safe entry point. It's a very safe entry point and worthy of heaps and heaps of praise. Garden Giant is just a fantastic mushroom with, with some effects we're still even learning about in terms of their ability to draw worms, forget what the meter radius is. They can attract worms toward your garden. It's really incredible stuff. Definitely, wor- definitely worthy of being the favorite mushroom of the moment. I love that. And then given your experience and your body of work, what advice would you have for an 18-year-old Amber who's kind of starting out on this journey? Well, 18-year-old Amber wouldn't have taken advice. (laughs) (laughs) I've gotten that. I've gotten that one a lot. People are like, you're assuming my 18-year-old self would listen. Yeah. I would say the advice is the healing is in the hurt. Mm. I believe that these sources of discomfort and trauma and difficulties that are not heroically praised by our peers and our culture, these are very important moments in a human's evolution and adaptation to a changing world. I think that we can proudly be part of the Scar Clan and wear these injuries from a place of reverence for our ability to continue moving forward. And that shame can be a very powerful way to suppress our power. So I would say to 18-year-old Amber, there's healing in the hurt. There's healing in there. And I know a lot of young folks who are in hurt places. We get many woofers and apprentices who struggle with severe anxiety. And I would definitely encourage people to find safe spaces to unpack some of that hurt and to heal some of those wounds. If it's with mycology and if it's with forest ecosystems, you can come and do that here. (laughs) We've got spaces for that sort of intention here. You know, to bring it back full circle to what we talked about at the beginning, the patience, the listening, the tenderness and openness is equally as valuable as the courageousness and fearlessness. And they need to walk hand in hand. And I really have a lot of faith in the younger generation. I feel like I've met some beautiful people and they're curious and they're deeply concerned and they're hungry to explore. And I, I hope that all of us who have seen seen a few more things, listen to those who have seen a lot more and we keep spreading the breadcrumb trail. I think those things you just mentioned about patience and tenderness, important to remember that, to apply those to yourself as well. And I think that's part of what finding healing in the hurt gets to. I, I really like that. And then another another big question, what is the lasting impact you hope to make with your work there on Moon Mountain with Ryan? I mean, what's the lasting impact you hope to have with that? Well, it's interesting. So I'm finding a defensiveness to that question that I'm not sure where that originates from. And to sit with that and unpack it for a minute, I think perhaps that it not be about me and it not be about Ryan and that the impact is one in which 
it's participatory in something that is far more profound and long lasting than any one human's legacy or history. So <laughs> I'm going to answer that question by not answering it because I'm not sure what this new co-created future is going to look like, but I definitely see us as part of it and inspired by it and eager to arrive there. But I, I perhaps hope that the impact is one that has nothing to do with the singular focus of myself or this organization. Sure, sure. Participating in this greater wave of change, whatever that looks like, not about aggrandizing the self. Yeah. A, a sage, a sage <laughs> response, a sage response. Well, Amber, uh, thank you so thank much. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you for sharing and being really open and really giving us a lot to think about with all of those great caveats that show you've done the work on yourself to realize that you're or you're not trying to project your truth onto everyone else, but it's really coming from a place of sharing what's worked for you and what your experience has been. And people can either find themselves in that or not, take what resonates, leave behind what doesn't. And I think you've done a beautiful job of making that invitation for people to share in your story without projecting it on them. So thank you for a very conscious and edifying conversation. Thank you so much for hosting these conversations and, and doing the deep, meaningful work. I, I see you showing up in the hard ways and uh, salute to you, my friend. <laughs>